Hey folks, George here again. This time we're going to talk about another work of Japanese literature, this time a short story by Murakami Haruki entitled The Elephant Vanishes. This story was written in 1985, and uh, Japan in 1985 was an economic powerhouse, uh, the second biggest economy in the world, only behind the United States. What was interesting about that is everybody, I mean, yeah, everybody was really scared of Japan at this time, thinking, oh my goodness, or at least everybody in America was scared of Japan at this time, thinking that Japan was going to take over the world, uh, Japan was going to buy up all of the United States, things like this. So there was a little bit of a fear similar to uh, what some more contemporary politicians in the year 2020 say about China, that China is uh, getting too big, economically speaking, and being uh, all sorts of, or uh, doing all sorts of, uh, yeah, nefarious things. However, following uh, the 80s in Japan, uh, and I will talk about this in a future video, we see that Japan was actually in the midst of an economic bubble, and that bubble bursts in the 90s. But here, Murakami's writing in 1985, and can he smell the bubble? There are some folks who do suggest that in the 80s, and especially the mid-80s, by 1985, you could kind of see this downturn that Japan was experiencing. And, of course, it was going to uh, burst in the 90s. But before that happens, let's talk about Murakami's story and see what kind of world uh, or what kind of Japan Murakami paints in 1985 through his short story, Elephant Vanishes. As always, I'm going to talk about my four story elements. We'll start this time with plot, characters, setting, and themes. Then we'll talk about uh, other sorts of connections like the structural features of the story, uh, historical details, uh, historical context, intertextual connections, and then of course inter uh, connections to myself. Let's start this time with the plot because the plot is fairly simple and I want to get right through this really quick. Uh, what ends up happening in the story is a man tells his own anecdote. It's all in first person. Now I'm talking a little bit about the structural details of the story, but it is a first person narrative where a man tells the story, uh, relates a story, relates this anecdote, that uh, an elephant gets brought into his town, his small suburban town in presumably the suburbs of Tokyo, as a sort of mascot or something, uh, this elephant is. And so as he uh, relates that story, he also relates the notion that this elephant begins to vanish, right? And ultimately one day it's totally disappeared along with its uh, the elephant keeper. Zookeeper is what I was about to say, but it's just one animal, an elephant. And the elephant keeper and the elephant vanish and are never seen from again. Uh, that's the first part of the story. Second part of the story is this man on a business trip, presumably, is uh, meeting a girl, trying to pick up a girl in a bar or something, and tells the girl this story about the elephant vanishing. And then he uh, relates that he never sees the girl again, although they did talk on the phone once. And uh, uh, yeah, that pickup line about an elephant vanishing from my hometown, I guess, doesn't work, at least in this story, to help him find a suitable mate. And that's it for the plot. That's it for the plot. Fairly simple. An elephant vanishes from a small town. A man tells a woman uh, the story about the elephant vanishing and how magical or mysterious it is. And there we are. And then he uh, ends out the story, it sounds like, with a little bit of depression or something. We'll talk about that in quite a bit of detail in a little while. So let's talk about the different characters then. Now let's move on to characters. Of course, the story is a first-person narrative. So we have this I character who is never named by Murakami. And this I character relates the story. What do we know about him? Well, we know that he has some sort of, uh, he relates in different times in the story that he has some sort of obsessive kind of tendency to collect all this information about the elephant and especially about the event surrounding the vanishing of the elephant from his town. And so we see him collecting all these details and claiming to be some sort of uh, authority. As a matter of fact, since 
he does collect all these documents and newspaper clippings and stuff like that. Uh, I say obsessive. Uh, I wonder if that word is accurate or not, uh, but it is interesting. Uh, what else do we know about this character? Well, he's a kitchen salesman, some sort of salesman, as we find out in the second half of the story, that he sells kitchens, and he says the word kitchen in the English language as opposed to the Japanese language, right? Um, what does that mean? Well, we'll talk a little bit about that, right? But here's another aspect of it, especially as we do talk about themes in a little while, the knowledge that this narrator, that this first person narrator claims to have. And at the beginning of the text, at the beginning of this story, he suggests I am especially well suited to tell this story because I have collected all these documents around the event. But then as he's talking to the girl in the bar, he relates that he might not be the best person and that he really doesn't understand this. He might not be the best person to explain the story. I mean, and that's quite curious because we get this self-contradictory claim. I am the best person to talk about, about regarding this story. And then later on, I'm not so uh, accurate when relaying this story. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, too. Of course, in the second half of the story, we also have another character of the woman. And uh, this is kind of one of uh, complaints that's frequently leveled against Murakami, the author, that he doesn't write women very well. And sure enough, in this story, the woman is paper thin, and we don't really see very many details about this woman, except that she is at this uh, event, and she's sitting across from this man listening to his story. We don't really get any depth or detail about her. Why? Well, yeah, that's a good question. And that is, again, a claim that's, or an argument, or a complaint that's frequently leveled against Murakami's writing, is that he writes women so poorly. Um, and sure enough, in this story, the woman is a character who, who is only there, it seems, so that he could tell the story to somebody. She's only there, it seems, to help him with his loneliness, at least while they're talking over a drink. However, let's try to be a little bit sympathetic to the author, Murakami, in that I feel like the woman does play a nice foil. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But she is, I think, a nice foil against the narrator who makes very market-based claims and consumer-based claims about kitchens, about the way to live life, about the way to work. And she is there, uh, although she's not a very deep character, she's there as a nice foil to push back a little bit against some of the character's claims later on in the story when he says, yeah, everybody knows this. And she kind of says, really? I don't know this. Talking about kitchens or something like that. And so that's a nice uh, role for her to play, I think, is as this foil, which leads to all sorts of other sort of uh, psychological analysis that we can do on the narrator or on ourselves or on Japanese society in general. And I feel like that's what Murakami does do with the female character as a foil to push back and say, ah, I'm not so sure about your view on the world. Right? Now, we'll get into details about that a little bit later. The other character that's obvious um, that we really talk to a little bit or we really see a very little bit is, of course, the elephant keeper. And the elephant keeper is interesting to me because he is this sort of magical character who disappears with the elephant, just vanishes with the elephant. And as a matter of fact, uh, Murakami describes him, or the narrator rather describes him, as saying the disappearance of this elephant keeper had no impact on society. And that seems pretty uh, 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 harsh to say about anybody, doesn't it? This person's disappearance doesn't really impact society at all. But again, I wonder if when we do analyze the narrator and analyze his ideas, and especially the woman who acts as the foil, I wonder if 
when he says this elephant keeper really doesn't impact society much. Remember again, that's the narrator speaking. I wonder if it's Murakami who's actually saying he does matter and his impact or his disappearance is a huge impact on society. So that Murakami, the author, is being a bit ironic here by having his narrator say one thing, but I at least interpret something radical, well, the opposite. I, I interpret it the exact opposite of what the narrator sees. We'll see how we can do that in a little bit. So there we've got these characters. Again, just to uh, uh, rehash really quick, we've got the first person narrator who's a typical uh, Japanese figure, I think, stands in for Japanese society and attitudes of Japanese society in the 80s. We've got this female character whom he tries to pick up at a bar whom I interpret as being her fo his foil and trying to throw some curveballs his way. And then we've got this magical elephant keeper. I'm going to call it magical on purpose. We'll talk about that in a bit. Who disappears along with the elephant and whose disappearance may or may not have a significant impact on society, right? You see what I'm saying right here? I, you, you could probably tease. I'm, I'm teasing some of the, uh, how we're going to discuss certain things in this uh, discussion here, right? What else is very interesting about Murakami's short story, Elephant Vanishes? The setting, the setting. It's very interesting that he chooses the Tokyo suburbs. We are in the suburbs of Tokyo. Why? What's interesting about that? Well, I just said a little bit earlier that 1980s Japan was, you know, the second richest country on the, in the world. And even many Americans feared that it would soon become the richest, the single richest country in the world, right? And what is suburbs? How do suburbs translate that sort of attitude? Well, what do we know about suburbs? Suburbs are places where affluent citizenry live, right? And as a matter of fact, Murakami does specifically say this suburb is a, a town with a very affluent citizenry who can support, after all, a pet elephant. But that does reveal quite a bit, I think, about 1980s Japan and this notion of the affluence. That is expressed here. As a matter of fact, one of the selling points that the mayor or one of the city bureaucrats makes in trying to keep the elephant in town while arguing against the naysayers, he says, give the land to land developers to build high-rise condos. And this actually reminds me of uh, Tanizaki's essay from 1933 in Praise of Shadows, where he complains about this constant building and this constant concreteization of Japan, this constant land development. And Murakami sneaks in a few of those little details here by this, placing this setting of the story in the Tokyo suburbs and mentioning, by the way, there's going to be a huge land development and condo high-rises around here pretty soon. So now we're getting a little bit of better idea of 1980s Japan and what Murakami is writing about. Now at this point, I usually talk about themes to close out the story elements portion of the discussion. However, I think it's going to be very important to skip that for now and get to the structural details or the formal details of the text first. And what do I mean by that? Because I think once we understand some of these formal features of the text that Murakami has written, we will see how the themes really fall out of that, right? And the first and most obvious thing that we have to talk about is the genre of this short story. It's a little bit controversial with some scholars, but uh, I think there are there is a nice consensus that does allow people like me to say things like, Murakami is a magical realist writer. What is magical realism? Well, magical realism is, let's take the second part first, realism. Murakami's telling a realistic story here, right? There's a man, he, an elephant moves into town, things happen, he uh, picks up a girl on a date, and then he ruminates 
about his life a little bit. That's very realistic, isn't it? However, that magical part is really interesting. Why magical realism? Because there's this one little feature, a vanishing elephant and a vanishing elephant keeper, that adds a little spark of magic to this story. That's what makes this text, in my estimation, uh, belonging to the magical realism genre of short stories. A little bit about uh, magical realism also, uh, it really became famous with uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a Colombian writer, and his uh, paradigmatic work of literature is 100 Years of Solitude, and 100 Years of Solitude being that paradigmatic magical realism novel. However, anybody who's read one of Murakami's longer or larger scale novels, uh, most of them at least, you could see these magical realist tendencies floating in, right? That there are these little magical things coming in. And yeah, there's a lot of stories with uh, little people coming out of ears or something in an otherwise realistic story. And why would an author write an otherwise realistic story, but then with tinges of magic, right? Well, I'll give my interpretation and my uh, hypothesis about all of this. One reason is, let's skip the magical realism question just for a second and then we'll come back to it. What other sort of idiomatic phrase comes to mind when we talk about elephants and elephants vanishing? Well, in my mind, I think of the idiomatic phrase in English too, by the way. There's an elephant in the room. There's an elephant in the room. What does it mean if you say there's an elephant in the room? Well, typically that phrase is incomplete, and you typically will say there's an elephant in the room that nobody's talking about. There's an elephant in the room that nobody's talking about, right? And I don't think that's a coincidence when we read this short story, Elephant Vanishes, because is there an elephant in the room that nobody's talking about in Japan in 1985? Well, I opened this discussion by talking about the economic bubble that Japan was right in the midst of in 1985. And as a matter of fact, in 1985, many people already saw the decline of Japan. Of course, following uh, World War II, when Japan was leveled, ultimately, and in shambles, there was, of course, the economic miracle of the post-war era from the early 50s through the 60s and into the 70s. And now here we are in, 19, in the 1980s, and Japan has become the second richest country in the world. Yeah, an economic miracle if there ever was one. However, if many people are able to look around and can predict an economic decline, which is what happened, or a bubble bursting. What is the elephant in the room that nobody's talking about? Perhaps it has something to do with this notion that Japan was on borrowed time, perhaps just starting in 1985, that Japan was going to have this bubble burst yet nobody was talking about it. I'll talk a little bit more uh, in the future when I talk about the economic bubble bursting and the features of that economic uh, bursting bubble. And so might that be the elephant in the room that nobody's talking about? What else might be the elephant in the room that nobody's talking about? Well, in the path towards this economic miracle, what happens? There's a lot of modernization in Japan a lot of westernization. And what goes along with this westernization, and this is a big thing that we are going to talk about in a couple minutes here, pragmatism or usefulness or cold-blooded capitalism and cold-blooded science. And I think, although uh, Murakami only uses the word pragmatism in this short story, I think that is uh, a word that can be substituted with cold-blooded capitalism, cold-blooded science, cold-heartedness. And what isn't there? Magic. Magic has left our lives. 
And that might be, at least under my interpretation, that seems to be what Murakami is writing about, what this character, what the protagonist first person narrator is really suffering through in this story. The lack of magic in his life and the lack of magic in the world. What do I mean by magic, by the way? Well, at least when I was a child, I believed in Santa Claus and the magic of Santa Claus. And of course, it didn't make any sense how a, a jolly old fat man would come through the chimney. I grew up in an apartment. We didn't have chimneys. So how did Santa Claus get in? Magic. Magic is the answer. And how magical the world was when I was a child. And then what happens? You grow up. And I stopped believing in Santa Claus. I'm sorry if I am spoiling it for any of you out there. Um, I don't believe in Santa Claus. If you do, God bless you. Knock yourself out. Continue believing. But I don't believe in Santa Claus anymore. And as a result, isn't there a lack of magic in my life now? Now let's just take that Santa Claus analogy and extend it to all other sorts of magic in our lives. Let's talk about religion. Right? How many people are atheists now, especially when you're talking about cold-hearted science, cold-blooded capitalism? And you stop believing in magic of religion. And so the same thing uh, might be said in Japan in the 1980s is that people stop believing in the magical. And what does that do when you don't believe in magic anymore? Right? Well, at least for this character, there seems to be an imbalance. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But now we see why writers at, from as far away a places as Gabriel Garcia Marquez in Colombia and Murakami Haruki in Japan are lamenting the lack of magic in the world around them. And it's not just literal magic of religion or the literal magic of Santa Claus, but might that magic, what is all that magic that comes along with traditional beliefs versus very pragmatic Western ideals of modernity, capitalism, science, empiricism? When magic disappears, doesn't something in our lives disappear too? Right? And I think that's what is important about so many of these magical realist works. And that's what I think when I think of the elephant in the room that nobody's talking about. Right? Well, maybe it's about all this nefarious economic activity that's happening, but maybe it's also about the elephant in the room that nobody's talking about is the lack of magic in our lives. The lack of, you know, I, I like the French phrase, je ne sais quoi. Right? That I don't know what. I don't need an explanation for every little detail. And doesn't that loss create a gap or an imbalance? or a lack of unity in, inside of us? And doesn't that lack of magic in our lives leave a sort of gap? Well, in my interpretation, it does for the protagonist, the first person protagonist in Murakami's short story. And it does leave him with that lacking unity of soul, unity of self, something along those lines. Um, and this is a nice segue to bring us into the themes of this short story. And, of course, the most obvious thing that we could examine here is unity. So from the second half of the text, when the first-person protagonist meets the girl, this notion of unity pops up here and there in the text. Now, at first, of course, the notion of unity is in reference to this kitchen that he's trying to sell. We'll talk about that, too, because it's a kitchen, right? Not daidokoro which he mentions very clearly. It's not the Japanese word, it's the English word that he uses. Why is that interesting? Well, I think it probably has to do with this lack of unity that modernity has given us. And what is modernity? 
well, where does modernity come from, at least from the Japanese perspective? Well, the English-speaking world, or the American world, rather, America. Where does this lack of unity come from? Well, the English-speaking world, America. And so it's important that he talks about a kitchen, not daidokoro, the female foil, the woman whom I suggested earlier is a foil to the first person protagonist. She uses the Japanese word. And he says so. He says, wow, it's kind of weird that she didn't pick up on the fact that I'm using the English word kitchen here. And why? Is that an interesting sort of foil? Well, I think it's because he's stuck in this completely modern world or this modern notion, this completely westernized lifestyle. And what has this westernized lifestyle done for him? It's taken away this sense of unity, so to speak, at least from the perspective of the first person protagonist, or at least from Murakami's perspective, or at least from my interpretation of Murakami's perspective. What's even interesting about this, and now I'm going to go a, a little bit back and forth on the structure of the story, because the whole first half of the story is about this elephant in the town and him giving the anecdotes about that event. But then there's an abrupt change right in the middle of the story where he talks about meeting a girl. And doesn't that sort of break the unity of the story? Doesn't that show that this story is kind of out of whack? And that's what I love about great craftsmen, great writers like Murakami himself here, is that he's crafted a story in such that not only is the notion of unity a significant theme in this work, but he's even used that broken sense of unity to craft the story and make an abrupt cut at this section of the story that breaks from before and then we're on to meeting a girl and talking to a girl. What is this unity then? And he says it very clearly, right? And this is what I sometimes dislike in certain craftsmanship uh, regarding writing is that Murakami, the author, does just give it to us unity. He does bang us over the head with this right here. However, he's talking about kitchens. So maybe that's how he's being a little bit tricky. And maybe if I want to forgive him a little bit there, although he is hitting us over the head with this notion of unity, I might forgive him because he's sliding it in in a different way. He's talking about the first person protagonist is talking about unity of kitchens. But my interpretation is more about the unity of life. So let's see how he says this here, 409, page 409 here. The most important point is unity, I explained. Even the most beautifully designed item dies if it is out of balance with its surroundings. Unity of design, unity of color, unity of function. This is what today's kitchen needs above all else. He's talking about kitchens. He's a salesman. Talking about kitchens, talking about the unity of kitchens in a house. But if he weren't talking about kitchens, and he was talking about lives or souls or whatever you want to talk about, flourishingness, what does it mean to have a flourishing life? Let's forget that he's talking about kitchens for a second. Let me reread that. Isn't it important for a life to have beautiful design, number one? What else, though? Balance with its surroundings. Balance with its surroundings. Isn't that interesting? Because earlier in this discussion, I talked about setting and how it seemed like, going all the way back to Tanizaki in 1933, that some authors are conscious of the notion that Japan and all this building, high-rise condos, is kind of out of balance with its surroundings. Murakami says it right here. An item dies if it's out of balance with its surroundings. 
is Japan out of balance with its surroundings? Are Japanese people, am I, let's not even talk about Japanese people, let's talk about New Yorkers. Are New Yorkers out of balance with their surroundings? That's an interesting question. Unity of design, function, color. That's what we need above all else. He says that's what a kitchen needs. Isn't that what we need? But he throws that word in there also. Function, unity of function. Why is that an interesting word to me? Because this story is mostly, well, mostly, this story is about a worker, a salesman who sells kitchens. That's his function in life. Is it? Is that what our function is? To be salesmen? Or should that salesmanship, whatever your job is, should that be in balance with everything else in your life? And that's what I think Murakami is talking about in this short story, that things are out of balance. That the first person narrator has become much too much of a kitchen salesman in this text. Too much concerned with his function rather than his surroundings. How else does this notion of function play out? Well, he has another word. Murakami uses this other word very frequently in this text. Pragmatic. Pragmatic usefulness. Usefulness. Pragmatic. How pragmatic is the camera that I'm shooting on right now? Well, it's a good camera. It's very useful as a camera. But is that all that we are? We're objects that are supposed to function in a certain way. Let's look at where he talks and really explains what this notion of pragmatic means, at least to the first person narrator. I'm on page 410 now, right at the top of 410. A kitchen probably does need a few things more than it needs unity. But those other elements aren't things that you can't sell. And in this pragmatic world of ours, things you can't sell don't count for much. Then here's where the girl, I said, is the foil. Is the world such a pragmatic place? I took out a cigarette and lit it with my lighter. I don't know. The word just popped out, I said. But it explains a lot. It makes work easier, too. You can play games with it. Make up neat expressions. Essentially pragmatic or pragmatic in essence. If you look at things that way, you avoid all kinds of complicated problems. The girl now. What an interesting view. He responds, not really. It's what everybody thinks. Not really. It's what everybody thinks. If we could be pragmatic, we eliminate all kinds of problems, don't we? Let's just focus on our function. Just be pragmatic. Just think about your usefulness, and you'll eliminate all sorts of other problems. Or will you? Or will you? And that's where the girl plays her essential role. Now, to push back against some of the Murakami detractors who suggest that he uh, doesn't write women very well, to me, this woman is Murakami's voice. This woman in the story is Murakami. Murakami, the author, is not the protagonist. The first person narrator, Murakami is the woman who looks at somebody who says, hey, pragmatic usefulness. That's what makes the world so much less complicated. Murakami, the author, and the woman. Really? Is that how it is? And then the smart aleck protagonist, of course, that makes everything so much less complicated. It solves all sorts of problems. Or does it? Or doesn't it create more problems, actually, and probably worse problems? Problems with unity. Problems with my place in the world. Problems with magic. And by the way, to say that Things that aren't that useful. Let me read that line again. In this pragmatic world of ours, 
things you can't sell don't count for much. Compare that to the elephant keeper, whom the protagonist rather explains, yeah, he doesn't really make friends with too many people. Not in our town. He was only connected with the elephant, the magical being in the story. And all the other pragmatic people, so the protagonist says, can't connect to the elephant keeper. Because the elephant keeper isn't useful. Not in this pragmatic world, at least. And so what has he done? He's disappeared. And he's gone where? God knows where. With his magical elephant that just vanishes. And that's what's interesting here. Because I, my interpretation, I feel like, really comes through on the last page of the text. That's where we bring everything home. But I feel like I could just read the whole page here. I felt like this a lot after my experience with the vanishing elephant. I would begin to think I wanted to do something, but then I would become incapable of distinguishing between the probable results of doing it and of not doing it. I often get the feeling that things around me have lost their proper balance, though it could be that my perceptions are playing tricks on me. Some kind of balance inside me has broken down since the elephant affair, and maybe that causes external phenomenon to strike my eye in a strange way. It's probably something in me. It's probably something in me that's out of balance, he says. After this whole elephant affair. And I love how he says it at the beginning of the paragraph. I would begin to think I wanted to do something, but then, like a pragmatic person who's cold, hard, and calculating, I would become incapable of distinguishing between the probable results of doing it and of not doing it. He's always thinking results-oriented. Wait, wait, is this going to work? And what about if it doesn't work? And da 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 Ah, I can't figure it out. That's okay, I won't do anything. In my estimation, that's a cold way to live because after all, without that magic, without just that faith, in yourself, in the world around you. What are the probable results of everything? Well, I love my John Maynard Keynes, who replying to economists who complain to him, well, you can't do that because in the long run that hurt. We're, we're, we've got to do something that's good for the long run. And how does John Maynard Keynes reply to that? In the long run, we're all dead. And so this protagonist is trying to think about the results of everything. But if you really think too hard about everything, you're of course going to be paralyzed. You're not going to do anything because after all, in the end, we're all dead. And is that any way to live? Well, the protagonist here acknowledges he's out of balance and it's something inside me. Let me continue reading. I continue to sell refrigerators and toaster ovens and coffee makers in the pragmatic world based on after images of memories I retain from that world. The more pragmatic I try to become, the more successfully I sell. Our campaign has succeeded beyond our most optimistic forecasts, and the more people I succeed in selling myself to. That's probably because people are looking for a kind of unity in this kitchen we know of as the world. Unity of design, unity of color, unity of function. So he acknowledges in that next paragraph, he acknowledges that he's very successful at business. He's very successful at being pragmatic. He's very successful at selling kitchens. But there's that lingering out of balanceness, isn't there? That Murakami is scared that too many of us are experiencing. When we focus too much on the pragmatic, when we focus too much on selling kitchens, great, you'll be successful at that. But isn't there more? Are you out of balance? Protagonist here clearly is. Let's close out this story. The papers print almost nothing about the elephant anymore. 
people seem to have forgotten that their own town once owned an elephant. The grass that took over the elephant enclosure has withered now, and the area has the feel of winter. The elephant and keeper have vanished completely. They will never be coming back. What will never be coming back? The elephant in the room that nobody's talking about. The magic. The je ne sais quoi. The faith. The religion. You pick your favorite. Fill in the blank. And that's what so many of us are missing. Murakami's right in 1985 Japan. I think this is just as true in 2020 New York City. That we are missing something that might never come back again. I talked about Santa Claus a minute ago. I'm wondering if it might be worth it to start believing in Santa Claus again. To see the world in a magical way. Except, what's the last line say? It will never be coming back again. Can I just choose to believe in Santa Claus? Believe in Santa Claus. Believe in Santa Claus. Believe in Santa Claus. I don't think it works that way, does it? And I think that Murakami is lamenting that too many of us, certainly in Japan in 1985, but I think just as relevantly here in New York in 2020, here in America in 2020, too many of us have lost the magic, that we're out of balance. I wonder if that's what Murakami is saying that too many people in Japan in 1985, but I think just as relevantly, too many people in New York, in America in the year 2020, are out of balance. They're too focused on work. They're too focused on something. And it's put us out of balance. And I'm wondering if that's what magical realist authors like Murakami are asking us to do. Welcome. A little bit of magic in your life before it disappears forever. I want to try that a little bit. I want magic in my life. I don't want it to go away. I want to keep a little bit of magic in my soul somewhere. And I hope you do too. We'll talk next time.